Hello and welcome to UFC's Inside the Octagon. I'm John Gooden alongside top UFC analyst Dan the Outlaw Hardy. On this show, we delve deep into UFC 204 as Dan and I unpick two of the supporting acts on a stacked main card. The co-main event stars UFC icon Vitor Belfort, desperate to get back into title contention after a roller coaster couple of years. But he faces a tough test against the former Strikeforce middleweight champion, gay guard Musasi. And there is added British interest. After a tough defeat to Anthony Johnson, Jimmy Manua looks to get back into the upper echelons of the light heavyweight division by defeating the fifth ranked Ovin St. Preux, who himself is keen to get back to winning ways after coming up short against the former champ, John Jones, back in April. So Dan, let's take a look at the facts and the stats. They live there. Two veterans of the sport, long and storied careers. It's quite surprising. We sometimes forget just how many times Gay God Mousasi has been involved in uh, mixed martial arts contests. It, it's amazing, really. I mean, we've seen Vitor campaigning for so long, you know, in the UFC, but, I mean, Gegard Mousasi's fought in every organisation that was worth fighting in. Yeah. Um, he's always been one of my favourites, and to me, this, this really is my favourite fight on the card. I'm really, really excited about this one. Yeah, very much so. Well, there's so much to look forward to with both of these guys because, of course, they can knock people out. They're both great with their submissions as well, despite maybe not seeing so much of that from Vitor Belfort. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's get into it then, and who have you got first? Well, let's start off with Vitor striking. Why and not? Start with a bang, <laughs> as he normally does. With a flurry, with a swarm. <laughs> Looking like someone outlast the Mohicans. <laughs> it's a good look for him. Um, so with Vitor Belfort, if he lands a good clean shot and he feels like you're hurt, or if you show a weakness, he's going to start to swarm. And this is something musashi has got to be aware of because this is effectively a controlled blast. He needs to control this as much as possible, which is not easy. Now, I think Weidman did a good job of covering up and allowing him to burn out, but this shows really where, where he's, he's so dangerous. If you close distance too quickly, he'll always find a way to catch you with something. Look at that beautifully placed uppercut on Dan Henderson as he stepped in. There was really no need for these follow-up shots. Dan Henderson was already, you know, already unaware of really of what was going on. And this was also nice to see as well. Not only is he a very explosive fighter, he's also very good at programming people. As you can see here with Michael Bisping, he started to program him with the body kick to set up the high kick. Now, at the end of the first round, it didn't land, it didn't work out cleanly. It hurt Michael, and this is the swarm that we talk about with Vitor Belfort. The hand speed is ridiculous, but that is the shot that, uh, that ended Michael Bisping's night. And as you watch here, we've talked about this before, what you're going to notice is Michael Bisping's right hand is going to reach forward. And what, I, what I'm assuming, I can't be sure, but if you, watch Vitor's, if you watch Vitor's left hand, knowing that it's such a dangerous punch, as soon as Michael sees that coming forward, he starts to look to parry it. So as you'll see, I, I know it's slow-mo, so I'm going to play it even slower. So as the punch comes out, you'll see Michael go to parry the right hand, which is not there, but it does open up the head kick. We've, obviously... we've spoken about fighters who disguise that big kick behind a hand. Yes. I think uh, Wonderboy Thompson is someone that does it yep. really well. Um, I tell you who else does it well. Uh, Cowboy Cerrone does it. Anthony Pettis does it really well. Yeah. But obviously the master of disguising kicks yes. is Anderson Silva. And that may have been a lesson that, uh, that Vitor learned <laughs> yeah, from course. Anderson Silva in their fight. Um, but we know Vitor's dangerous everywhere the fight goes. He's obviously most dangerous in the early rounds, but we're still seeing developments in his game which makes him unpredictable. That is probably one of my favourite knockouts in I the UFC. It. I mean, how many times can we see it? Oh, it's beautiful. And watch how he spins back. He pivots straight back so as not to waste any time. He can jump straight on his opponent. I mean, there's a reason they call him the Phenom. He kind of took the UFC by storm. He came out with hand speed and boxing that no one had ever seen. He's a Carlson Gracie black belt, so we know he's legit on the floor as well. But even at his advanced age in his career, we're still seeing developments in his game. And the spinning attack and the head kick attack is something that in, mo in his most recent fights has looked more devastating than ever. I really like the way that he follows up. It sounds ridiculous to say, but some fighters pause. Yes. I think we saw against Henderson there. He hadn't, Henderson's back hadn't really hit the canvas, and he'd already keyed up his next shot. Yeah. It was in the chamber. I think that's one of your terms. Beautiful. In and the, and the other thing there. as well is because he's so fast, even when he throws 10 punches and nine of them don't land, you can't cover every single one of them. Yeah. And there's a variety in his strikes. He'll change the direction in which he's striking, so something's going to get through. Everything he throws is with power, especially when he senses a, a, a weakness. When he senses the end of the fight, he just swarms on people. And that is when he's absolutely terrifying. So we 
Speaking about Belfort, and already I'm, I'm kind of like, oh my God, it's, it's about to go off. <laughs> There's an explosion. And then we get to go guard Musasi. And now, now I feel a little bit more relaxed <laughs> because that's the way that he carries himself yeah. until, of course, he starts letting his hands go and, and all the other various weapons he has. Yes, a, a master of uh, range management. Beautiful to watch. Again, another one of my favourite fighters, which is why this is such a fascinating one for me. But they're, they're polar opposites in the way that they approach <laughs> fights. I mean, sure. really, they are. You couldn't, <laughs> yeah. you, they couldn't be more different. Because uh, Vitor is the guy that waits, he waits, he sees the opportunity, and then he just explodes like crazy. Gegard will, even if you throw and he moves out the way and sees an opportunity, in the early rounds, he may not capitalise on it. He waits. And sometimes he's been criticised for this. A lot of the time, it looks like he's kind of sitting in third gear. It looks like he's always got more to give. But Gegard is one of those guys that fights to the level that, he's, that he's, his opponent is. You know, so right. when he's fighting someone like Vitor Belfort, who he has so much respect for, who he knows is dangerous, this is when we're going to see the best Gegard Musasi. Okay. And there's also a story to this, a bit of a, a background, as there is with the main event of this one. These guys should have crossed paths before a few times. Yeah. Th th there was a time when there was a different event in, in Vegas that they should have matched upon. They couldn't agree on weight at the time. Gegard was fighting at light heavyweight and Vitor was fighting. I think I remember this. Now moved yeah. down to middleweight, so that didn't work out. Then there was another opportunity where uh, Mus Musashi was lined up to fight uh, Gustafsson, I believe, and Gustafsson was pulled out. There was a pen potential of him being replaced with Vitor. That never came about either. And speaking to the Musasi camp, they spoke, they spoke about legends fights. They want these marquee fights against these guys that are effectively like superheroes of mixed martial arts. And when Gegard was campaigning over in Strike Force, him and his friends always used to talk about, oh, what if I fought that guy? And, you know, it was like, like the Marvel DC thing, you know, what yeah. if these superheroes clash? A bit clash? like the Josh Barnett and Arlovsky storyline. Exactly, exactly. So this is one of those fights he's been campaigning for for a long while, and he wants it. I know he wants it. And I also... I'm pretty sure who, I, who he wants next as well, which I'll, I'll let you know in a second. Okay. So talking about striking, let's have a look at Masasi. Let's, let's look at how chilled he is, how relaxed he is. This is the first, you know, right before the fight, so calm, against Dan Henderson, who we know is dangerous, um, a very, very dangerous guy. But look at his range management. Look how he's, he just moves back, he finds space, and he creates opportunities for himself. Always balanced, always prepared, and always coiled like a spring. You see him moving back here, catches him with a jab just to slow him down, and then bang, the short right hand right on the temple, rocks Dan Henderson, and then he swarms immediately. So he does have that 0 to 60 if he needs it. He does have fast hands if he needs it. This is a beautiful shot as well. I want to talk about this. Against Costas Philippou, he just he, he outclassed him, basically. This was a fight where Philippou just didn't seem... Uh, he didn't seem comfortable at any point. He didn't feel like he could land anything on Musasi. And you can see the range management. You can see that, that, that Philippou here is he's aware of what's going on. Musasi's just kind of taking him apart. Now watch this. He's going to step forward here. He's going to flick out a jab. He gets a reaction there from Philippou. Flicks out a jab, hits with the right hand, then rolls underneath. Look at that. Hands are down by his waist. He's so comfortable in this Very range. Very aware. Very aware. He knows what, he, what his opponent's options are. He takes these guys apart. Beautiful roll underneath there, as you can see, and out of the way, very comfortable. Not only does that, does that shock his opponent that they didn't land, but it also discourages them from throwing more, which if he can discourage Vitor Belfort early on in the fight, that's going to be very useful because that is going to slow him down, take him into later rounds where he does become less dangerous by all accounts. At UFC 200, he was fighting Santos, and again, beautiful range management. Look how patient he is. He's looking for that shot, but he's controlling the octagon at the same time. Not really throwing a great deal. Steps in, lands a jab, steps out. But then watch this. So he starts to crowd. He realizes Santos on the back foot, so he doesn't mind walking through a couple of punches. And when he knows he's hurt, this is what I'm talking about with the swarm. But when he starts to recover, he realizes that it's not the right opportunity to burn himself out. So then he starts to be more tactical. He starts to break him down again and he starts to cross face. Now watch this, he's trying to strip this grip here, he's trying to collapse him down to the floor. Landing a few shots, Santos is really forcing to get back up. But watch this, so Santos has now, now brought his hand in. Let's just zoom in on that for a second. So he's brought his hand in to prevent this cross face again. This is not something that was comfortable because Musashi is able to turn his head and really cause him a lot of pain. Now as this progresses on, what I want you to watch, watch for is how he feeds the hand. There we go. So. He knows that Santos has got control of this wrist here, so he doesn't have to control Santos's hand. He doesn't need to take control of this wrist because he knows that that's already tied up. Santos is opting to tie his own wrist up. Yeah. So what he then does is he passes it over to his other hand, strips the grip. Look at that. Beautiful work. 
strips the grip and then pulls that arm really tight under his arm. Now he's exposed. And not only is he exposed on this side of his head when Musashi's got the free arm, but he's also tied up his back leg as well, his grapevine, his back leg. Yeah. So it really limits uh, Santos's options. So what he's done is he's restricted his, his choice. He, he now can't turn away from him. He has to turn into him because his arm's tied up. What I really like about this as well is he was trying to remove that post at first and very quickly made the decision, the hand fight it, I'm not winning that. He exactly. tried it twice and very quickly used that, that grip and passed it through. It's, Beautiful Super clever. adaptability. And this, this is partly down to the way that he prepares for fights as well. I know that they don't do a lot of drilling, a lot of technique stuff. He just goes in and spars and spars and spars. Yeah. And he works with a team of guys that he trusts. So um, he can test things. He can try things in the gym and he knows he's not going to be punished for it. Right. These are the kind of realizations you have in live situations because this is not something necessarily that you can drill. You have to recognize this opportunity when it's there and take it in that moment. And so this is basically just rounds and rounds of sparring. They go across face again to try and control his opponent. Now he's on the floor. Watch this opportunity. Santos jumps back to his feet, uppercut, big right, big right hand to finish the fight. It was just a, it was a masterclass. It was a beautiful finish. And Musasi has the ability to, to deconstruct a fighter mid-fight, take them apart, read his opportunities, and start setting them up. And because he's so calm and he's so relaxed, you know, he just kind of edges forward. You don't feel threatened, you know. People, people kind of go, okay, he's not going to throw anything. And then not to 60, there's the jab. And you're like, whoa, hang on, he hit me. You know, he, he, he kind of lulls people into this kind of, this sense of security where yeah. they feel like he's, you know, they're going to have to see him move before he attacks, and he doesn't. He's a cold snake all the time, even though he looks relaxed. He's got that not to 60, just like Vitor Belfort has. I think he's also struggled with motivation in some of his earlier fights in this tenure with the UFC because they haven't been big enough fights to really get him excited. Yes. He's going to get excited about Vitor Belfort. He's, he's been excited for this fight for probably 10 years now. You know, this, yeah. this is a fight that he's not even, even before there was an opportunity for him to fight Vitor Belfort, he's been thinking about these, these superhero fights, these yeah. legacy fights, the ones that are going to define his career, you know, for, for the future, going to move him up the rankings quickly, but are also even taking out names that people recognise that are household names, like Vitor Belfort, like Anderson Silva. I think that's the guy he okay. wants next. You know, as he's climbing up the rankings, he's going to be looking at these guys. Anderson Silva's still sitting there, you know, just outside the top five. If he gets this win over Vitor Belfort, that's, for me, the next logical step. And knowing Masassi, I think that's the step he would like to take as well. OK, time now for you guys at home to become involved. Thank you very much for getting your questions across. We are going to go bottom left here. Hey, Jimmy Ives. Jimmy Ives. So who has the advantage if it goes to the ground, as both are very skilled there? Well done for recognising that, Jimmy, because I don't think we've seen an awful lot of Vitor Belfort on the ground in recent years in the UFC. But both guys are excellent. Very true. Well, as I said, Vitor is a, um, is a Carlson Gracie black belt. Um, he, we've seen good. We've seen good groundwork by him. I mean, I've got a couple of examples. I'm going to throw out in a second. <laughs> what I will say, and this is just a personal theory of mine. This is, you know, from being around veterans of the game, from watching people move through their career, and how their training changes, how their preparation changes. When you veto Belfort, when you've got the Carlson Gracie black belt in your back pocket, yeah. and you're building a team around you, you're not going to necessarily drill every position. You're not necessarily going to keep those skills sharp. Vitor knows what he's good at. He's good at knocking people out. So his, his team, his training camp is built around this. I've actually been in Vitor's training camp a couple of times. I've, I've helped him out for a few of his fights. And I see how he constructs a team around him. It's a beautiful thing to do. And, you know, when these fighters get higher up and they've got the finances to do that, I mean, it's a very beneficial thing. Because he's not with black zillions anymore. He's got his own individual camp now. He's always moving around. He's always been a very nomadic fighter. Um, I mean, we could have called him the Ronan, just like Carlos Newton, to be honest. He moves, <laughs> right. he, he moves around quite consistently, which is nice because it broadens his, his, his skill sets. It, you know, it keeps his eyes open to developments in the game, but it also allows him to build a team around him that are solely focused on him. It also does give him a little bit of control, though, in these situations. So it's you know not necessarily like Gilbert Burns, uh, the USC fighter who fought at the weekend, was yes. um, was his jiu-jitsu coach. Now Gilbert's a young up-and-coming fighter. It's very difficult for him to go in and say, "Hey, Vitor, you need to be doing this," because Vitor's, you know, especially in Brazil, you know, he's carried through the streets like a god. You know, sure. So so. It, there is a there is a, a downside to not being one, in one of these big gyms. Uh, there is a downside to not being able, not having a guy that takes control, like Gegard has in his camp. 
So we see, we've seen, I mean, well, let's get into it. Let me show you. So with, with Vitor Belfort, the first thing I want to talk about is his takedown defense. He's got a wicked sprawl. Yeah. Like, like nobody else in the division. He's very good at reading people. Look at this in his last fight. Throws a knee straight into a sprawl against one of the best grapplers in the world, without a doubt. This was a surprise to a lot of people. And you can see him controlling the forearm of John Jones. He spins for the armbar, he threatens the armbar. And a lot of people didn't expect him to be able to attack from this position. Now, he didn't finish this, but John Jones acknowledged that this was very close. You know, so he... did his elbow. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then against Anthony Johnson, who is an absolute monster at, at 205 now, uh, Vitor Belfort took him down, controlled him on the floor, and beat him up to the point where Anthony Johnson really didn't have any other options other than to give his back and submit. So we have seen submissions. We do know that that's an option for him, but it always yeah. seems like a secondary option. It's never the, f never the first thing he goes to. Sure. With Gegard Mustassi, however, he's very much a dictator on the ground. He will very much take you down. Against, the Uri against Uriah Hall, he had a great first round, which was unfortunate in, in the way it ended because I think it discouraged him in being aggressive in his fights. But watch this. So Uriah Hall now has done a great job of rolling to, to his knees. He's also looking at this single leg, which can, which he, he can then start to threaten, even if it's okay. to get up. But what Musasi does, and this is something else that we see, um, this is something else that I see, uh, you know, an opportunistic development in his game, something that he saw that he realized was a good opportunity. In this situation where, where uh, Uriah Hall is on the floor, Musasi has reached around and he's actually got a control of his thigh. You can just see his fingertips here. Let me just zoom in on that for a second. You can just see his fingertips on the inside of his thigh. Yep. So what he's going to do is he's going to elevate that thigh, he's going to lift the leg over and bump him straight over onto his back. Beautiful work. And then straight into striking as well. There's no breathing space with yeah. Musassi on the floor. He's smothering. He's aggressive. Everything is uncomfortable. And again here with Costas Filippo, it was a constant quick level change that just took Filippo out of his game, put him on his back and smothered him, beat him up on the floor, made him hesitant, hesitant to throw. And even, even in a sprawl, even in a defensive situation, look how he's sliding his hips back. He steps straight and he goes for a high elbow guillotine that turns Mark Munoz onto his back. A great wrestler. Look at this balance as well. And I'm going to show you something which I, I literally just noticed a couple of hours ago, which I'd never noticed before. I need one of these TVs at home <laughs> so I can play with this. That's you. <laughs> right? So Mark Munoz being such a strong wrestler, look at that body lock, powerful body lock, managed to wrestle him to the floor. He's used this leg effectively to trip Musasi and take him down, but because Musasi's balance is what it is, because it's so good, he's able to still land this knee down and start to resist. He's got the whizzer on this far side as well. So what we're going to see, and let's, let me just circle this. Pay attention to this foot of Musasi. Very sneaky little movement. Uh, good for upsetting the balance of Mark Munoz, good for keeping the scramble going. He's going to slide this foot back. He's going to hook that foot and elevates it. You see how he's lifting that with yeah. his back leg? Yeah. I mean, he, he doesn't hold it for very long, but what he's done, it, what he does is he lifts this leg up and he, he goes straight over to the other side with it, which allows him to take a mount position. So watch this. As it plays through, he lifts, and then when he sees his opportunity, when the balance shifts, boom, straight into mount. Yeah. That seemed like it's similar to a half guard sweep where you always let someone pass you and then you take that trailing yeah. leg around. Yeah, very but, nice. But like these, these are the little nuances in the game which I love, which a lot of the time I miss the first couple of times I watch it. And it's not until I get these opportunities to start pulling things apart. Like the, the McGregor Diaz finish in the first fight. Sure. The little traps that, that, that uh, Diaz was using yeah. with the legs. These are things that Musasi does instinctually because he's, he, he's always working in life situations in yeah. the gym. And then from this point onwards, he uses his ground and pound. Like I said, immediately works to strike in, starts to threaten the choke. And watch this, he controls this wrist for a second to allow him to strike, which opens up the neck. And then he finishes with the rear naked choke. And, you know, and, and to be able to control a wrestler like Mark Munoz on the floor like that is absolutely astonishing. You know, it, he, has, he has such a high IQ. And not only does he have such a high IQ out, uh, inside the octagon, he also has one inside the octagon. He also has one outside of the octagon as well, looking at these guys and pulling them apart. He sits and has long conversations with his teammates and his training partners. And I will say, I do know that he's brought some specialists over from Poland to help him with his grappling. He's trained at Burt Cops Gym in Amsterdam, which has got a, a, just a mat full of monsters in Thai boxing. Yeah. 
So he's got a real, real wealth of knowledge around him, and he just feeds off all of this, yeah. you know. And he stayed in Holland this time. He stayed in Amsterdam to prepare for this one because he knows that Vitor is going to want to bang. Yeah, and don't underestimate Dutch kickboxing when no. it comes to this kind of thing. Exactly. I love it. You said it at the beginning, the matchmaking is brilliant. I feel <sighs> I even more about that now, that, that kind of, you know, aggression from Belfort to the laid-back Musasa. They're both very, very nicely matched indeed. Coming up next, we look at the light heavyweight matchup between OSP and Jimmy Manua. Let's pull up the facts and the stats for this one, Dan. So, home interest in the poster boy, Jimmy Manua. Physically very similar there, maybe a slight edge in the height there for OSP, coming off of a huge fight against John Jones, a massive opportunity yeah. he had there. Scary dudes. Two scary dudes. Scary dudes. <laughs> Don't need to say much more. Both generate a lot of power. Both very, very scary. Yeah. Great fight. Really fun. OK. Scary dudes. <laughs> uh, but what more have we got to see about exactly why they are so scary? Well, they're, they're both good strikers. They're both very powerful, as I said, but they're both very different. OSP's far more instinctual, a little reckless, very opportunistic in his footwork, in his striking. Uh, not nearly as tidy as Jimmy Mano, as, as you'll see from this playlist here. A bit casual, you know, hanging out, ready to go. But th this, this really shows you how powerful he is. Now, Glover Teixeira was a world beater at one point, and he just could not keep a hold of Owen St. Pru. Look at that, beautiful stuffs his head, comes straight with the strike, watch the body kick. Oh, I don't ever see body kicks take people's legs away like that. <laughs> and again, swarms on people, knows how to control them, knows to get out of, out of situations which he doesn't want to be in, like on the ground, underneath Patrick Cummins. Watch him roll straight over, use his strength just to stand back up. Such a great athlete, isn't he? Amazing. And you've got to think how discouraging that is for, a, for an Olympian. Now watch this knockout. This is, again, just absolutely beautiful. Foot placement, hand placement, opportunistic. Boom, look it's, at that. We've seen this before. It shouldn't work. It shouldn't. I mean, he's, Everything's he's, wrong about... He's moving backwards. He's, he's, in a, he's in a very unathletic stance. I mean, let's have a look at that. But he's posted. He's posted one hand. And this is something we see with Anthony Johnson as well, which at some point in the future, I would love to see the, those two guys fight. Um, both very big, powerful punches, as well as Jimmy Manoa. But you see, you can see him posting here and finding an opportunity, finding a window uh, of, of space to throw that big, powerful punch through. Cracks uh, Patrick Cummins right on the chin, turns his head away, and there was nothing else he could do from that point. Separated him from his sensors and sent him to the mat. And we're going to see that from one more angle as well, just because it's such a beautiful punch. Boom, there it is. As he's moving backwards, finding opportunities. And because, because he's not, and this is another good example, because he's not, he's not the technician, because he's not done hours and hours of hitting pads and, and refining his striking skills, he finds ways to win. He relies on his athletic ability and on his footwork, but he's not constrained to any particular type of movement. We've spoke about this in the past. When you're sparring with that beginner in the gym, often they'll catch you with things that you're not going to expect because they are quite reckless, they are a little untidy, but physically uh, very, very dominant. Look at this straight punch that he lands as he stands up. Boom, straight through the guards of Fejiao. Just didn't expect it forced him to curl up in a ball in a very defensive shell and then just get bombarded with, with a lot more powerful punches. An opportunistic fighter, very instinctual, very present, very in the moment, and handled the pressure of fighting John Jones very well. I mean, that's something that we've really got to give him credit for. Yeah. You know, John Jones always comes in, you know, with, with such a, an aura about him. We know how dangerous he is and how talented he is. Ovid St. Bruce stepped up, he got in there with confidence, and he, and he held his own for, you know, for, for the duration of the fight. Yeah. Absolutely. But Jimmy Manua, a big opportunity for him. He's just come off the back of, again, a, a huge, huge opportunity in fighting Anthony Johnson, who's just ridiculously powerful, as you, as you well know, Dan. Uh, it makes you look good every time Anthony Johnson goes out <laughs> and puts people away. He was being nice to me. Yeah, OK. Well, I don't believe that. Uh, but I was actually lucky enough to go and spend some time with Jimmy during this fight camp, and he is a technician. The way in which he does everything, he's kept his same team since he came to the UFC all the same guys, really just fine-tuning stuff. Two things for this, though. He's put on more weight, so more strength. More strength work so that he, wow. he will have to be cutting more weight for this one. And the second one was the work that he's been doing for a southpaw. So two takeaways okay. that I found when I was Very uh, in the company of Jimmy. You know, he's got a good team of guys around him, and it's been working for the duration of his career. I mean, when you come up against guys like Anthony Johnson, he's always got that X factor. He can always catch you with a good, clean shot. I mean, DC found that on the way to winning the belt. You know what yeah. I mean? It was There was always that danger of getting caught with that one shot, the one shot that sent him crashing to the canvas. Fortunately for him, he managed to recover. 
but Anthony Johnson is a very scary individual, and, and Jimmy Manawa just stood trade blow for blow with him. Yeah. You know? And interesting to say that he's put on more weight. Obviously, that's looking at Anthony Johnson and going, exactly. He's a monster. I need to be a bit yes. bigger in this division. But for me, Jimmy is a very, a very technical kickboxer. He's got a, a very refined style, which is nice to see with someone that's so naturally powerful. Because usually, when someone has natural power, you, they become quite reckless. So when you when you've got someone who you've, who you've managed to um, to basically educate in a in a in a striking art and and control that power. He's able to find opportunities to use it. I mean, just lifting Cyril Debate off the floor, and even when he's even when uh, when kicks and punches are being blocked, you can see them upsetting the balance of his opponent. You know, if you take one of those kicks on the forearm, it's going to do just as much damage to your arm as it would if it ca caught you in the ribs. Here against Ryan Jimmo, uh, rest in peace. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and Kyle Kingsbury knows about it more than anybody. This was on the same card as I fought last in my hometown, and Kyle's a good friend of mine, and this was just brutal to watch really shows how scary of an individual Jimmy Mano is. And this was early on in his, in his UFC career as well, when people were just really starting to understand yeah. his potential. But look at his footwork. Look at look how he's, he's reading his opponent and his opportunities, finding the opportunity to land that body shot. Now, a lot of strikers with the power that Jimmy Mano have got, they're headhunters. They don't look for those single shots that do the damage. But look at that. He knows Kyle Kingsbury's covered up. He could quite easily start just wailing on yep. the head. But he reads that opportunity. He looks for that opening. There it is, midsection. Boom, thunders it in. And Kyle Kingsbury's a massive light heavyweight as well. Yep. He's one of the biggest guys in, in, in the division. It always has been. But Jimmy Manoa's technical ability was just too much for him. And then you couple that with his power. And when he knows that you're hurt and he starts to really lunge forward, sometimes he gets a little reckless, but he's good at pulling back and controlling. OK, he's going to level change. I'm going to skip him with that lead knee. And then controlling, bracing the head and landing good, clean knees. I mean, that kick was the one that really did a lot of the damage to, to Kyle's uh, face. Such a calm, cool individual, confident in his power, confident in his, in his athletic ability and his, and his skill, just able to walk people down and kickbox with some of the best guys in the division with the same kind of power that a guy like Anthony Johnson or Ovis and Brew can, can uh, generate. Yeah. Scary individuals, both of them. Fighting at home as well, Jimmy Manuel, the poster boy. I think 14 and 1 in the UK. Oh, it's crazy stats. Yeah. Yeah, really looking forward to that one. Uh, with such a huge event taking place in the UK, we couldn't ignore some of the top local talent on the bill. So make sure you check out the show where we put a heavy focus on the prelims and examine the chances of the best of the Brits. Don't forget to get involved in the comments below and get in touch via the UFC's social media outlets. That's all from us today. Remember to check out all the Inside the Octagon shows landing in Fight Week. You can use the links in the notes below to get to those. Cheerio, and we'll see you next time. Michael Bisping is the new middleweight champion! This is the greatest day of my life. What do you get for the man who has everything? Dan Henderson is famous for knocking me out of UFC 100. You get revenge. Some say revenge is sweet. I disagree. I think it's better than sweet. Be careful what you wish for. Honestly, I don't know why Michael would want to rematch with me. You can't erase history.